So good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Friday, uh, June 3rd, and the next edition of our California Nevada PGA chat. My name is Len Dumas, Executive Director of the Northern California Section PGA, and uh, we're grateful to be with you uh, once again. And uh, we did miss last month, and that was in honor of uh, past President Riley attending his service in Southern California. For those of you uh, and ourselves included that have had the honor to get to know uh, Pat Riley, that he's certainly PGA through and through and a fire and an example to all of us in the passion and the things that we can accomplish when we stay together and put our, our minds together. So once again, we want to say thank you to our partners, the Southern California section of the PGA, Executive Director Tom Addis, Assistant Executive Director Nikki Gatch, or Chief Financial Officer uh, Jeff Johnson. And uh, we do have our presidents we'll get to in just a moment, but also on our on-air team throughout these past couple of years, uh, Bryce Seaver, Steve Monday, and uh, Shelby Zell here in Northern California. So we have uh, as our guest today, uh, Randy Smith, PJ. Randy, uh, probably one of the most celebrated PJ members and certainly instructor, multiple award winner, which we will uh, talk about soon. So we're very grateful for Randy. Need to be here and our own director, uh, Mr. Craig Kessler, to keep us abreast and keep us in tune with what's happening uh, with legislation and other issues here in the state of California. So, with that, uh, before we turn it over to our good friend Tom Annis, a uh, couple of words from our Northern California Section PGA president, uh, Mr. Eric Rip Lippert. Eric? Len, thank you very much. Tom, everybody on the call, thank you for uh, always keeping us all together. Great to see some great to see your faces. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and, um, you know, looking forward to a great meeting here, but also um, hope everybody's getting through what looks to be a, probably another busy, busy summer. So, um, you know, make sure you get some rest. Hopefully you get some vacation and, and uh, we'll get through another great summer. Uh, bank all that money and then <laughs> hopefully get to spend it for Christmas. So, but thank you all for being here. Yeah, thank you, Eric. And now to our partners, uh, partners in crime, if you will, the executive director for, for the California PGA, Mr. Tom Ass. Tom? Yeah, good morning. Uh, thank you, Len. Good morning, everybody. And, and thanks to the entire crew here this morning. Uh, we have missed you. Uh, it does seem, Len and I are talking this morning, it does seem like a very, very long time uh, doing these once a month uh, have been um, uh, interesting to say the least, uh, considering uh, how often we were with you, uh, at least through 21. Uh, and uh, we appreciate being with us this morning. Uh, it's my honor at this point and this time to introduce the president of the Southern California section uh, Mr., uh, from Newport Beach Country Club, Mr. Robin Shelton. Well, Tom, thank you. There's, uh, there's clearly a lot of intros going on around here this morning. Um, but I think, hey, these chats just provide a really good tool to be informed about what's going on on the government side of things, uh, the regulatory side of things, and also be uh, educational on um, the events going on in the world that aren't related to that. So obviously we talk about, hey, the, the rise of, of Scotty Scheffler and what he's done at the start of this year is pretty, pretty incredible. So I think, hey, this, these are just such cool ways to be informed and educated on, on current events, uh, some of them that are very essential. Uh, to what's going on in our business, others just what's going on uh, in the gaming industry. So we have done that again today. So I hope you enjoyed today's speakers uh, and I hope you enjoyed today's chat. And as Eric said, best wishes for a great summer. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Robin, and, and appreciate your time and appreciate, Eric, your time. Uh, and uh, we hope with Randy and Craig today that we have a great conversation. Len? Okay, thank you, Tom. And I see that uh, Randy is not quite ready. So let's start with our Director of Public Affairs for the Southern California Golf Association, uh, Craig Kessler. And for many of you who've been with us for all these uh, chats for over two years now that Craig has been a part of that as well. So a couple of topics today, Craig, that we'll dive into. One is uh, a bill that uh, seems as though we had to kill it twice, but maybe the second time sticks. 
is uh, 1910 having to do with the conversion of uh, golf courses deemed to be underutilized into low-income housing. And then as we head into summer and no restrictions are starting to roll out in Southern California, of course, on the issue of water. So Craig, let's take them in that order or whichever you're comfortable with. And uh, thank you once again for being with us. Well, thanks for having me. And uh, I would have to say that we uh, had to defeat AB 1910, otherwise also known as AB 672, not, not twice, but thrice. Uh, and I think uh, the third time it struck out. So I'll just start with a conclusion. That be, uh, since the last time we spoke, um, the, a bill that would have um, created, would have given free money to developers and local agencies to uh, slice and dice their municipal golf courses into affordable housing complexes um, died. Uh, we killed it. Uh, and uh, I'm not gonna go into all the details. Of, well, I'm gonna go into some of the details of how we did, but that's the significant thing is that this bill that at least we at the Southern California Golf Association referred to as the most damaging bill to be filed against, aimed at the heart of the game of golf in my time anyway, which is a long time, as you can tell for those of you who are watching by Zoom. Um, and we, we so much so that we tagged it, our, our name for it was the Public Golf Endangerment Act. Although after a while, I started taking to calling it the uh, open, the Park and Open Space Endangerment Act because that was really uh, what it was aimed at. And that was our hope to characterize it that way so that others in the park community of which this bill tried to excommunicate us uh, might come to our, might recognize that our, our battle in this case was also their battle. A small element of that happened with the Trust for Public Land and a couple of others and some municipalities, but it didn't ha happen to the level that I think we had hoped going into it, uh, which is not because it was not a compelling argument, uh, but because I think many sat on the sidelines as people are wont to do and figured that uh, we would take the brunt uh, of the uh, of the arrows, the slings and arrows of, of defeating it. And they, I think many organizations sat on the sideline and felt that if we couldn't strike it out for a third time, it would move to the Senate and maybe there would be greater involvement. And of course they knew something that we knew is that the bill was going to get a much chillier reception in the Senate than it did in the assembly. And ultimately it got a pretty chilly uh, reception in the assembly. So bottom line is on May 19th, it, it died in suspense and it got a lot of, uh, got a lot of publicity and it got a lot of play. I mean, roughly 200 bills uh, died in that process, but for whatever reason, uh, this one uh, took the headlines over some other bills that were in my mind were considerably more significant and had considerably more opposition. But I think it's something that we've come to learn is both the strength and the weaknesses of our particular sector is that people like to focus on golf. Uh, sometimes for positive reasons and sometimes for negative reasons. So let me simply say that um, in politics, whether, you know, it's never over, uh, whether you just had a great victory, and this was a, a, this was a victory for the golf community, or you, had a, or you had your worst defeat, the sun comes up the next day, and all that both victory and defeat mean is that you, is that, um, you have a different set of both challenges and opportunities. In this case, our challenges coming off of this victory are involved the, involve the notion that um, the issues that animated this particular bill haven't gone away. Doesn't matter what demographic you poll, what area of the state you poll, doesn't matter whether they are Republicans or Democrats, conservatives, liberals, libertarians, whatever. Housing is the number one issue affordable housing in particular is the number one issue in the state. And as long as the golf industry, or as long as the game of golf has to be played on anywhere from 100 to 200 acres, and those 100 to 200 acres are on prime real estate in California's urban areas, real estate that's worth an incredible amount of money, real estate that we know that others have always eyed, mostly in the recreational community, but this is the first time we had it eyed in terms of solving a housing problem um, that we're always going to be vulnerable. And we have to always remember that. I think one of the things that we did well in this campaign was to 
insulate ourselves against the charge that this was somehow golf versus public versus housing. But we said from the beginning that if it gets down to that, we're sure to lose. So what we did was simply frame the issue as one of open space, recreation, quality of life, environmental benefits, all those kinds of things, quality of life benefits. And that got down to the notion that we avoided the, not, not just so much the all too easy temptation, but the fact that our industry seems to have a knee jerk reaction of always reverting to a financial argument, which I think speaks volumes more about the way much of our industry thinks about the way the world works than the way in which the actual world works. One of the numbers or statistics that I always manage to inject into every conversation and my sort of uh, you know, coda to this issue, which will appear in Four Magazine next month, is to remind everyone that if you took all 960 golf courses in the state of California, that adds up to about 144,000 acres. In the city of Los Angeles, the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy protects from all forms of development moving forward, 155,000 acres. So that puts it into context of what we're talking about. There's a good reason why we set aside those 155,000 acres. They go to the same issues that we have municipal golf courses in Los Angeles or San Francisco or San Jose or San Diego or Fresno for that matter, any of the large cities in the state of California, because it goes to the quality of life, it goes to quality of life issues. It doesn't go to jobs, it doesn't go to revenue. And I wanna emphasize that point to this friendly audience on the call. Golf, private, public, otherwise municipal, is not a very high and best use, good use of, of land in terms of, in terms of an economic argument. In term, it pay, we, pay no, we pay negligible property taxes. And in fact, in the municipal sector, they pay no property taxes, but even privately owned golf courses pay property taxes as open space. And that's rather significant in the ledgers of, of, of municipalities. The jobs created, they're important to us, but 150 acres in, in, in urban California, you can produce a whole lot more jobs, a whole lot more economic activity. So we need to get away from that argument and, and get to the arguments that really sustain the value of golf courses. And I'm, my, I'm, my hat is off to this, to no, not just this organization, but to all the organizations that came together to defeat this bill. And that included at a national level, the United States Golf Association for the first time in its history, it weighed in on a political issue in a state capital. And I think they got a taste of a victory here and kind of liked it. And I think you'll see that in more state capitals, including ours. Like ours may need more help from them than most, but that's, that's the burden that we carry moving forward. And everything, like I said, is focused and related uh, again to a set of arguments that won the day for us. And let's keep in mind, it's important to focus on those things that win the day and not on those things that uh, in, the, in this case, uh, when it became uh, on this particular bill, 8, 1910, um, to have led with the economic argument would have been to lead with the argument that would have uh, put our heads in a noose. Uh, just be, I'll just be blunt about that. There are gonna be some who hear this beyond the conversation, who love that financial argument and that jobs argument and the size of our industry, which is by the way about 30, well, the last time we checked it was 13 billion in California. It's probably closer to 15 billion because we're doing awfully well in the game of golf right now and uh, we'll continue to do well. So my hat is off to everyone. We didn't just defend our interests well, but in the process of defending it, we got a lot of media uh, we got an editorial in the Los Angeles Times that said everything about our game being affordable, accessible, diverse, and all the things that our, some of our, uh, our adversaries like to point to as different, as, as the opposite, and they made that case for us. And the other thing coming out of this, and it'll be the final comment I say about AB 1910, is that we had a lot of private conversations disproportionately in the southern half of the state, and that's a challenge we need to address going forward as well, particularly if the speakership moves from um, a southern California legislator to a northern California legislator, which looked inevitable last week, but uh, may not be so inevitable now. We'll see how that shakes out uh, after this year's session and somewhat around Labor Day. Uh, but um, what, we, what we, we convinced people was this is kind of a dumb idea and a dumb bill. 
and golf's maybe a good thing for communities. And I think we can uh, hang our hats on that moving forward. Now that's the good news. Uh, we protected that, and in the process of, of defending ourselves, I think we made a we did a lot of things for the game of golf that amounts to making good proactive and positive arguments. But then there's the matter of water. I don't know, those listening in Northern California may not realize how acute the problem is, but 6 million of, uh, of metropolitan water district Southern California customers, which includes those in Los Angeles and Ventura counties, are under 35% restrictions that started Wednesday. And um, that's because uh, the state water, pro that's because this, these areas are disproportionately dependent upon state water project. And those deliveries are down to 5% and will probably be reduced to zero. The difference between 2022 and 2016, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? We had a drought, is that the, the amount of water that was in reserves in reservoirs in 2016 was much greater than it is in 2022. And given the fact that the last three years are the driest three consecutive years in, on record, admittedly record is not long in geological time, the, panic is if there is a fourth or a fifth year like this, we may be looking at substantial portions of Southern California where the water allocation will be teas and greens and nothing in between. But for the moment, rest assured, this, this industry is very resilient. We uh, are we're working with uh, our golf facilities in Ventura and Los Angeles counties, not so much with the Inland Empire areas, because it's a lot of small districts, which makes it very difficult for the industry to get, a, get everyone together and have these meetings. But because of a lot of work that was done previously in, determin in determining uh, alternative means of compliance and various other things, I'm pretty confident that, uh, that uh, with contingency well, plans, the uh, golf industry is, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get through this and uh, we'll, we'll do it well and we'll do it in a cooperative way. And I think we'll do it in a way that will get us good media coverage uh, because because we don't make the mistake of some other industries that wait to be chased. We chase the regulators and we, we again, begun meeting with them before these things come into effect. But I want to indicate for those of us who have been hardened by these continual drought, drought, droughts and may think this is just, yeah, we've handled this, done this before. I want to emphasize this, work, this moment is worse than 2016 and it's going to spread beyond those 6 million customers, ultimately to all 19 million. It will not spread to the Coachella Valley uh, for a variety of reasons I'm not gonna go into, but it's gonna make it into Orange County and San Diego County and beyond. And of course, Santa Barbara County is totally dependent on local supplies. They, but when they, their access to the state water project is such that they only, they're only, they only get access when, when they need it, when they need it, they can't get it. So it's always a little bit of a vicious circle. But the North cannot be far behind. And if you remember the last 20 to 14 to 20 to 16 drought, uh, the water agencies didn't treat the Northern Gulf community quite as well as it treated the Southern Gulf community, uh, particularly in Marin and Contra Costa counties. So I keep that in mind as that sort of tightens. So we have no control over mother nature. We have some measure of control over policy. We've been effective, I believe, in, in distinguishing between ornamental turf, we're not that, we're functional turf, but notwithstanding, there's just so much water and there's just so much strain. And, um, and again, our best position is to always to position ourselves as being cooperative. So with that, I can see Randy's not only with us, but he seems a little bit antsy as he, you know, he moves around in that chair even more than I do uh, as, as, while listening and so forth. So. And that's it. And we're, I'm not going to. So, I uh, if I if I uh, raised any issues that asked you know posed any questions that people have, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, just say that we come out, as we come out of um, you know one we uh, we come out of a very successful moment uh, legislatively. Uh, we're moving into another. Pro I, you know, just on a personal level, I would have liked a breather instead of being thrown you know, from one storm to the next, and excuse the bad pun, uh, but we're on top of it and um, we will get through it. I know at least in the Southern part of the state, all the organizations are planning along with the USGA and some national organizations, they made a major water summit. Uh, that's not been announced yet, but it's August 18th at um, in Chino Hills at Los Serranos Golf Course. Uh, and, um, and, and I think that we're gonna, what we're gonna do that day is highlight just how resilient the industry is, 
just how far ahead we are. There's a reason why we're considered the most efficient outdoor irrigator among water districts and water providers and water professionals. And that's good. And as I've said many times, and I've written many times, that's a laurel and we should be proud of it, but we can't rest on it because we're gonna have to, uh, we're gonna have to hone those credentials and go just that much further and faster in those areas in order to remain a viable industry as California continues to grow, and as we continue to recognize that a warmer, drier climate yields less runoff from a snowpack as it did before, and then of course we're getting less snow and we're getting less precipitation, and it tends to come more and more in these atmospheric rivers, and we don't have the infrastructure to capture those rivers, it just ends up going to waste mostly out into the Pacific Ocean. So I think everyone recognizes that, and there's an infrastructure that, that can be built to capture that and store it. But from the recognition that we need the infrastructure to coming to, res to resolving, to building the infrastructure, to, to getting the infrastructure finished, I think everyone knows how long it takes to build or do anything in the state of California. So there's a long time between now and then. And I'll close with, I'm gonna quote the new head of the Metropolitan Water District uh, Adel Haja Khalil, who has been quoted more than once in the Los Angeles Times, that we are not going to conserve our way out of this problem. However, because of, because of the only tool that's in our toolbox to deal with the emergency we have at our door is conservation. So for a long period of time, that's what we're going to be faced with. And keeping in mind that as important as we think water and golf courses is, in the scheme of things, when it comes down to decisions about households, agriculture, hospitals, uh, you know, public, uh, public institutions, uh, the general public does not consider us all that important. But rest assured, even in all the ordinances, no matter, even when we get the level six drought, we can still water the greens and the teas, but not much in between. So we'll be able to cope with it. Sorry, I was a little bit all over the map here today. And I vowed I would uh, resist the temptation to do a bit of a victory lap on 1910, only because um, <clears throat> as, as the person maybe involved in that, what we will call a victory, I know, uh, I know how precariously close we were and could have been to losing this one. Luck played a bit of a role. And uh, I'll just be blunt about it. Uh, the fact that we had a, a Southern advantage in the terms of certain committee chairs and certain districts, and even the author of the bill um, served us very well. And had, we, had, the, had there been a Northern uh, edge to some of those factors, we might be looking to a campaign in the Senate right now. That is no way to stake our future. We need to do better than that moving forward on a totally statewide level. And um, I'm willing to do whatever it takes, and I know the organization's on this phone to do it. So with that, it's good to be back with you. I generally get second or third billing, and, and I hope it didn't, it didn't bother anyone that, that I was up here first today, uh, but I think that just was a happy accident. So thanks, uh, Len, Tom, the two sections, for putting up with me, and uh, I'll sign off now. Great. Thank you, Craig. And again, thank you for uh, these over two years plus of keeping us uh, aware of what's happening at a very, very detailed level and a level where we can be uh, most effective. So, uh, and I hope, uh, Craig, that you're going to stay with us for the remainder of today's program. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce Randy Smith. Uh, Randy, thank you for joining us here for the our California Nevada chat with the Northern California Section PGA and the Southern California Section PGA and many of our partners. Uh, Randy is an Odessa, Odessa, Texas native and has been at Royal Oaks Country Club in Dallas uh, since 1977, uh, which also was the time he was elected to PGA membership and became in, director of instruction in 2013. Uh, at the Randy Smith Teaching Center is currently also a golf professional emeritus uh, at Royal Oaks, certainly one of the most celebrated golf professionals and instructors in our industry with multiple, multiple awards around 20, both nationally and locally, including PGA of America Golf Professional in 1996, PGA of America Hall of Fame in 2005, the Texas Golf Hall of Fame in 2011, and Northern Texas Section awards include 1989 Golf Professional of the Year, five-time 
Northern Texas PGA teacher and coach of the year. Uh, the, uh, as a matter of fact, we also have the Randy Smith Youth Development Award as a, an award in the North Texas Session 1984 PGA Professional Development Award and the 2015 uh, Distinguished Service Award. Uh, we're almost done, Randy, almost. And uh, Randy's worked with uh, Harrison Frazier, Chris Cox, Matt Weinberg, Colt Nost, Ryan Palmer, and uh, Justin Leonard, of course, uh, 12 year, twelve career PGA Tour wins uh, with Justin, including the 1997 Kemper Open and the Open Championship, the 1998 Players, and then in 1999, of course, the amazing uh, Ryder Cup putt at the Battle of Brookline. And currently working with Scotty Scheffler, who he started with in uh, elementary school. Scotty has four PGA Tour career wins at the moment, the most notable, more than likely, uh, certainly the 2022 Masters, currently number one in the FedEx Cup standings and currently number one in the world golf ranking. So, Randy, again, thank you for being uh, with us today. And uh, how did all this get started? Well, first of all, Lynn, I want to tell you an update on Dr. Ruby. The Dr. Ruby's moving up to the seventh flight from the eighth flight. And I'm so proud of the way he's come around. He's really worked hard at his game. And I uh, just can't tell you how proud I am of him. And you kind of left him out of that resume there. But other than that, I'm doing great, Lynn. How are you doing? Yeah, just great. Just great. Randy, so Randy. <laughs> hey, Tom. <laughs> how are you? Thanks. Good. I got all your texts there a while ago. Yeah, sure. I can't help it. I was going to pick my nose anyway. It didn't matter if I was on or off. <laughs> Same old, same old. Have a good you one. Bet. So, Randy, tell us a bit how to get started. I know there was some time at Tulsa Country Club even before uh, Royal Oaks, correct? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I was at Tulsa Country Club for about two years. Uh, basically, you know, kind of grew up in West Texas, went to school at Texas Tech. And when I figured out my golf scholarship was not going to be really enough to get through, I turned professional. I was in college at, and worked for Mitch, uh, Gene Mitchell Sr. and Jr. there at Lubbock Country Club uh, while I was going through school. Learned a great deal there. And then uh, one thing led to another, went to work for a phenomenal golf professional, Buddy Cook at Tulsa Country Club, who I'd, I'd known forever and uh, went to work up there and truly got in the business at that point. And uh, after a couple of years at Tulsa, he Buddy walked in one day and he said, uh, Randy, uh, there's this job down in Dallas at Royal Oaks. And I'd played the transmiss there when I was in college. And uh, he just said something. We were at a great club, Tulsa Country Club. But it, he said, it, it's Royal Oaks. Uh, I just wanted to ask you a little bit. I said, take it. Because I love this place. I mean, I'd been here one time. And I knew it was a phenomenal spot. It was in Dallas, Texas. I was a Texan at heart. And uh, by golly, he came down to interview, did, and brought me here. And the rest is history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Randy, at what point did you know that uh, teaching was where your heart was leading you? Well, you know, it, it, it's kind of odd that I probably sat and listened to Tom Addis do a number of, you know, seminars and things like that, you know, and I thought, well, I'm a PGA golf professional. I'm going to be something else. So, man, I'll tell you what, I was going to merchandising seminars organizational seminars. I even got to teach a couple of business schools. I was hot stuff, PGA golf professional, right? I knew the Mark Darnell color wheel backwards, forward, sideways, man, I was really something. I made that shop look so good. It was unbelievable. The sales were great. And I was a nice merchant. And uh, that went on for a while. And then all of a sudden this little kid I had out here in about 1980 two, three, something like that. Started playing some pretty good golf, 13 years old, wins an AJGA when that got started up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, of all places. And he came in that night with the trophy. His parents drove him back. He comes walking back in my office. I've been working with him. You know, I, I'm a well-rounded teacher. I gave at least seven lessons a week, whether I need to or not, you know, because I had to take care of my color wheel and my shirts and all that other stuff and instead of entrusting it to the staff that I had hired and the kid walks in with the trophy and he said randy uh this is and i said man i'm so proud of you he says this is wonderful we talked a little bit and he turned around and he's going to leave with this trophy and i was watching him walk out the door he stopped 
turned around, came back, and held the trophy up. And it said, yeah, now I want to know more. I didn't know how to digest that for about two hours. I just kept thinking about it, but it was very ironic that I started going to more seminars, but they weren't merchandising. Mm -hmm. They were teaching. And through that, I found a, a really cool deal that if I could go up there and teach and, and work on a person's game and I could turn a dead pool slicer into somebody that hooked the golf ball, whether their scores got better or not, but you took a slicer to a hooker, I could, I guarantee I can sell them all the shirts I want to up in that shop because we could do that. And that's where my wake up call was. And uh, Randy, what was the road? Did you change? Uh, did you change your method or did you have a method at that point? Did you have a goal for a player to hit the ball right to left or to hit the ball left to right or work with their skills? Because those are the things, as you said, I mean, you work seven lessons a week. So the experience was just incredible. You know, how, how did you start to develop your, your eye and your philosophy? Well, that's kind of the point. If you're given seven lessons a week, you're not teaching. You ought to refund mm -hmm. the money to those people, those seven people that took a lesson that week. Because you're up there, straight left arm, keep your head down and follow through. All of those things can't happen in a golf swing either. But, you know, you're really not teaching. And by getting up there and, and seeing how you could get a person to move a club, move the face, to produce hooks, things like that, and just doing it a little bit by trial and error and also watching a lot of great teachers. I would be a sponge back in, you know, 80, 81, uh, you know, watching other teachers, great teachers teach. And all of a sudden, you know, I started developing a few things. You know what? I can try this and I can try that. And boom, boom, boom. And it was really by trial and error as, as I started out. Tom? Yeah. Hey, Randy, uh, a question for you. And when you, uh, this, this may be uh, a little bit too far along here, excuse me, uh, too soon. When, when you picture a golf swing, and, and I think you referred to uh, Justin there, the 13 year old, uh, I'm, I'm guessing that's who you referred. Uh, and, uh, and, and now Scotty, and the swing picture is at least from my perspective, is completely different with those two. Wow. Yes. Okay. I got some. I got some. I observed something properly for a change. You did a great job. All right. Coming from you, I'm done. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, thank you. Um, how do, how do you formula? How do you work with two different golf swing, two different swing pictures? obviously two different uh, individuals in stature what what's what's your your work around there what's your strategy there um or is that getting too deep no no it's not getting too deep at all because you know we're you're talking about two of the most elite players really to have played the game and the thing is i didn't work with elite, elite players starting out i worked with dr ruby I worked with Mrs. King. I worked with the six-year-old that was left-handed, but he had to play right because his parents said, you must play right. You know, I worked with all those people developing kind of a thing what worked to me. And when you look at, at Justin, and it's really kind of cool because we're kind of messing with a few things now. You know, he's getting ready to play some champion tour events. And it's kind of really kind of cool watching how he's really not changed that much. Justin is never going to do what Scotty Scheffler does with the golf ball. It ain't going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Scotty is six foot three and some change. He's got huge long arms, long levers, long legs, long everything. Justin doesn't. And so when I was looking at Justin, everything was based around control, control of the golf ball. He couldn't afford to miss fairways because he wasn't long enough. Now, we can do all we want to, but we're going to, the most we're going to pick up at any time in his career is maybe 10 yards. And that's as far as we could go. So everything was built around accuracy. The swing was built around accuracy. And he was smart enough to understand for him to compete at a young age as a small kid, he had to have a short game that would absolutely crush everybody. 
And so from that standpoint, we work that direction on accuracy, accuracy with irons, woods, everything. With Scotty, it's a little different deal. And plus times have changed a great deal. You know, the, the long ball is very advantageous to playing good golf. In fact, 99.9% .9 most important thing. But at the same time, he's got the ability to do certain things. Plus, Justin played soccer as a young kid. Now, you could put him in the a trash can. He was he's tiny. And he never got much bigger, bless his heart. But he only played one sport. He played soccer. And he did that only in the infant stages of third, fourth, and fifth grade. Scotty, on the other hand, is a full-blown athlete. He can slam dunk basketball. He can beat anybody, including Matt Kuchar, any day they want in ping pong. He may be an elite ping pong player. Uh, played football as a youngster. Uh, played baseball as a youngster. Lacrosse. I didn't know anybody even thought about playing lacrosse, but lacrosse, he played a little bit of that. In fact, after he won the United States Junior Amateur, uh, there. California, I think. He came back and the first thing he said to me was, hey, and he was in the middle of a growth spurt. He was getting bigger and bigger. He says, I want to play my senior year on the Highland Park High School basketball team. Uh, what do you think? I says, as long as you don't break your ankle again doing backyard stuff, you can do it with supervision. I think it's fantastic. A lot of people said, Randy, you're nuts. That kid's, he just signed, didn't sign it, but he just committed to the University of Texas play golf but yet he was going to play basketball in his senior year I just it just said so many things to me the team concept uh I want to I want to keep my horizons a little bit wider and he was phenomenal as a basketball player his senior year only played one year high school basketball senior year and he was absolutely a stud month so he's an athlete Justin's not He's built this way, Justin didn't. You have to take what each player needs, wants, and what their desires are to be successful. I want to be able to hit the ball higher. I want to be able to hit the ball lower. I want to do certain things. You take what the player is telling you, and then you kind of put together with what you think they may need, and you formulate a plan from there, irregardless of who they are. It comes from what they want. Oh, we got muted again. Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, finger slipped off. Appreciate that. That's very interesting. Thanks, Len. Yeah, no, Tom, of course. So, Randy, thank you for that. And and another difference, certainly with Justin and Scotty, is they're 25 years apart, you know, between 20 and 25 years apart. In that, in that time frame, equipment changed, fitness changed, technology changed, all of the things that we learned. So, Randy, how did, how did you stay on top of that for those really two and a half decades between Justin and Scotty? And, you know, we can't go back, but knowing what we know now, would things have been different then and that type of thing? And the, so your thoughts on clubs, uh, uh, facilities getting longer, you know, needing uh, Kiowa last year, the PGA Championship was played at 7,800 yards. Uh, recently at Southern Hills, it was played about 7,400 yards. So how has all that led into all of those components, fitness, teaching, equipment, technology, uh, changed your teaching or your approach? Oh, I'll tell you what, it's changed it a lot because you knew it was there. And you can, you know, be real honest with you. You thank Tiger Woods for doing it. I mean, when Tiger would get out there and, and, and do the workouts, the other players, when he first came out, were watching that. Then they saw the length of the, the, the shots that Tiger hit with the driver were almost, they, they were so long, it was unbelievable. Yeah. So the players are making no. Then that kind of blossomed a little bit. Well, guess who was one of the first ones to get on that wagon of working out and everything? Justin was. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, he saw this. He was, all of a sudden, he was doing some stretching, but did it help him? Absolutely. But that frame and what he had, and the type of, uh, I guess, muscle groups he had, how fast they moved, is not going to change much. Right. But it did help his overall health and longevity. 
And that's one of the things I think you got to understand. A fit person, number one, if they're fit, they're going to perform better. If they're fit, they're mentally better at what they're doing. And that helped Justin the most. Now, Scotty, he works out. He does his stuff. He's done his stuff since he was in high school. But in high school, it was a little bit of this and that. And plus, you had high school uh, weight training people. Okay, let's do some 150-pound benches here for 100 of them. And when I found out that was going on, I said, this has got to cease because you're going to tear up something. You're not trained to be the next defensive end. You're training to be a player. It's got to be golf-specific. And uh, he did, he's done a marvelous job with it. In fact, when we went to the University of Texas, there was a little bit of that heavy-duty weight training. And those people down there even got more into golf-specific training and the stretching, the mobility, and strength instead of just going for bulk. So it, it's had a big, big, a big influence on how we play the game. But at the same time, you've got to add the equipment in too. You know, the equipment's going further. You know, you've got a, you got a driver now that, it, number one, it doesn't want to spin. Number two, it doesn't want to curve. Hitting a golf ball that doesn't want to spin, and it doesn't want to curve. It might be hard to sell that to the average 18 handicapper at the club. It doesn't want to do that, but that's at speed. It does not want to do those things. Well, when a player understands the harder he can hit it, the straighter it's going to go, and he doesn't have to try to weld a hook in there to get the extra distance. That's going to make the game a lot easier for a lot of people, especially if they're athletically inclined rather than just going out there and playing by numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, Randy, it's an interesting point because we talk so much these days about the American development model, and that feeds into one of the contrasts between Justin and Scotty, where now we're totally encouraged uh, to play multiple sports, as you said, Scotty did. And because it helps our body development, helps our mental development. But yet at the time, you mentioned Justin was uh, pretty much one. So that the whole philosophy of bringing an athlete along, if you will, as opposed to developing a golfer per se, is now part of our fabric in the PGA in the uh, in terms of the Amer uh, American. Justin moment, you know, with the trophy back when he was 13 years old. How did you come in contact with Scotty? Uh, well, in fact, I was still working with Justin at the time. Uh, got a phone call uh, here at the club that there was a family moving here from New York. And they had a little kid that was just eat up with golf. And he was six, six and a half years old. And uh, they wanted to come out, and just come to the club, meet me, look at the club, so forth and so on, just to kind of look around. Well, it came from a referral from somebody that said, well, why don't you go out there? So they came out. Uh, I've just finished, if I'm not mistaken, working with Justin. So I went down there. They are, okay, I'm going to go down there. I'm going to spend my 15 minutes down there and shake hands and, and see the next coming of Tiger Woods. And that's what you hear all the time. This kid's great. Look at these films. This is the next coming of Tiger, Tiger Woods. And I said, okay, I was all prepared for that. I walked down, here's this little kid that wasn't, he couldn't have been three foot, maybe two and a half, three feet tall. Little bitty, tiny U.S. kids clubs, all this kind of stuff. And he's sitting there in a pair of long khaki pants, golf shirt, a belt that looked like, you know, half the belt's hanging out over here because it didn't fit. And he's hitting shots and he just keeps hitting shots. And I just walked up there, introduced myself, hi, how you doing? He walked over, took his hat off, shook my hand. Could see him went back to hitting golf balls. He just hit balls on, you know. And I talked to his parents a little bit, and while I was watching, you know, I said, "Hmm, this is interesting. Hmm, this is real interesting." And long story short, that uh, fifteen minutes turned into about two hours and fifteen minutes of just prompting this little guy to hit certain shot, just up in the air, hit it low, hit it right to left. Can you hit it left or right? So I just kept challenging. And the little guy just nods his head. And he says, yeah, that wasn't going very far. But it was doing basically whatever I want. You know, I said, do this. Well, is your driver do this? Do that. Two hours, 15 minutes of just watching this kid do this. He does not stop. He just keeps hitting balls. And I said, hmm. Then it dawned on me why it was so 
cool to see that every single shot the six and a half year old kid was hitting was tied to a target. It wasn't down the range. If it was curving left to right, it was curving back into the target he selected. He might have only been on that target for maybe five or six balls, changes targets, goes another one. So everything he did was created to the uh, creating a shot that went to the target. And I knew right then, I said, that's something you just don't see. You just don't see that. You want to see kids want to hit balls and want to hit long, hit a car, boom, boom, boom. This kid was a little surgeon at six and a half. And uh, I just told her parents, they said, well, if he came out here, would he have a, would this be a place he could grow up and do this, uh, you know, and get better at the game? I said, absolutely. I'd love to see him out here. And they joined the next day and the rest is pretty much history. So as you work with Justin now, Randy, as you mentioned, he's heading to the Champions Tour. Uh, still the same, working on accuracy, or there are some other aspects that uh, you've come across? Well, I hope he's listening because he's, he would, boy, he would, I can hear it now. Uh, I think he's leaving, in my opinion. Uh, this boy's in good shape. He hadn't been sitting on the couch eating Sundays. He's been working out, skiing, snowboarding, uh, playing golf with his, his kids, so forth and so on. Uh, running marathons. This guy is totally fit and in shape. And I saw him uh, about four weeks ago when he was here for the Nelson. And I, I mean, flexibility is more than he's ever had. Uh, power, he's got as much or more than he had when he was in his prime. You put that with the new equipment. He's mentally got to get to a point where he knows he can hit the ball 10 to 15, which we know he can. But that old accuracy thing that you worked on that made him so successful creeps in. But when he goes plays the Champions Tour, it'd be awfully nice to pop another 10, 12 on that driver, even if it rolled into the first cut. Heck, if it rolled in the rough, it's not going to be that bad anyway. And get a little close to the green so those really good short irons can go to work. So there's a couple of things he can add to his arsenal when he goes out to play. And uh, Rennie, talk talk a little bit. You know, probably one of the most historic moments in golf was certainly uh, the putt at Brookline uh, in 1999. And I believe that was I believe he was a rookie on the Ryder Cup team that year. And my goodness, that that really changed the face. That one was that was strong. I won't tell you because that same kid that made that putt, I think, was four down. Tom, you were there. I mean, I, I can't remember because it was a haze to me. I was watching every bit of it. Was, I think yeah. it was four down, right? Yes. And uh, I think he had uh, ended up three down at the turn and was it was horrible. He was struggling. He was trying. He was, he was gritting it. He was grinding. He was tense. And I'm going, this isn't the way this kid plays golf. So I got Davis Love, who was fin already finished his match. He came over and said, you get in his ear. I mean, get next to him. Tell him, play like Justin. Be Justin. Be himself. Let it go. He says, Randy, I've been walking with you. If I get any closer, I have to be in his pocket. And I said, get in his pocket. Sure enough, he got out there, and Davis kept walking along, and they could see that there was a little bit of relaxation once Davis showed up and then boom, one hole. Yeah. Made of them. Then all of a sudden somebody missed one. Then he, then all of a sudden, Justin drains that thing on six to 15. He drains about a 28 footer for birdie. He's just a sweeper. And all of a sudden the thing went to even. And I'm going, whew, showtime. Well, he hits it tight at 17. And, uh, Jose Maria, he hit it a little bit left, whatever, chipped it up there about four feet. And I swore Justin was going to make that putt to go one up right there, and he didn't. He hit a great putt, didn't go in. Then he gets to 17. Doesn't hit the best second shot he's ever hit in his life. Got that long old putt down there. And uh, so I couldn't get up by the green. I was in the elbow of the dog leg. And I'm sitting over on the right-hand side, and I'm straining to see the green after he kind of hit this little chunky thing out of that first cut of rough there at Brookline. 
it hit and bounced up there. And something about that 17th green, I'd heard there was some history with it. I know how Crenshaw felt about it. And 17th green this, 17th green that. I, you know, I had that in the back of my head. And then Justin goes over this putt. Now I'm about 160 yards away at the elbow of the dog leg. And he gets over it. I'm grinding to see this, you know, and the putter goes back, the putter goes through, the ball's maybe a third of the way there. And I went, oh, God, I've seen that look before. Frozen. He, eyes would not move from that golf ball. Next thing I know, there's a tree and there's this limb up above me. I'm in this tree. I have no idea how I got there. Boom. Now, how am I going to get down out of this tree? I jumped that high, evidently, and went nuts. Climb back down the tree, run over to 18 fairway. Amazing. Amazing. What a moment. We'll never forget, Randy, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, as we, as we, what, what's next with Scotty now? We, here he is, uh, Masters winner, 2022, and uh, number one in the FedEx Cup standings, number one in the girl, world golf rankings. And so what, what are you two working on now? What's your conversation and, and where are we going? For the last 10 weeks, zero, zero. Uh, worked a little bit going into Scottsdale, waste management this, that, and the other, and he gets his first win, okay? Then, you know, he goes, comes home, he's got a little time. We talk about stuff, do the same things he's been doing, working his distance wedges, all that kind of stuff. Technique-wise, zero. He does pretty good, that, uh, that tournament down there at, uh, what was it, Bay Hill. Then I go with him to Austin after being home for a few days, zero, nothing. Doing the same thing, working on the distance wedges, telling jokes, running around with the other kids. He's got three little kids that follow him everywhere up on the range. They run his track man numbers. They give him grief and they're 11, uh, 13 and 16. And they're there all the time. So it's just those little guys with, with Scotty and having fun for two to three, four hours at a time, working on nothing. They asked me after, after Augusta, now what are you gonna work on? You know what I said? Nothing. And he had a little problem at the PGA, but it wasn't all swing related. Had a little problem over at Colonial this past week. Really wasn't swing related. Butter did this, Butter did that. He's been putting it beautifully. I'm not gonna change anything, still nothing. It's kind of like that guy comes off the mound in the eighth inning with a no hitter. And he sits, you know, baseball player, and he sits down the end of the bench. And then one person on that bench is going to go down and talk to him. They don't even want to go by him. And that's literally what we're doing right now. Now, if he asks a question, I'll answer it and I'll suggest something. But that's about it. And I've got a few things in the back of my head that he can get better at and things that he can do. But right now, during this stretch, the way he's playing the game, which is the key is playing the game. It's not how, you know, we may swing a club this way, that way, or whatever, but you play the game for your report card. And that's the scorecard you turn in. And while he's playing like this, we're not going to introduce anything that would change anything. Randy, thank you for being so generous talking about Justin and, uh, and Scotty. So let, let's, let's talk a little bit more about Randy Smith, an incredible career. Uh, Randy, again, being at Royal Oak since 1977. Tell us, please, about some of your moments, the moments that surprised you, perhaps, with an award or, or some type of celebration or acknowledgement, but the things that you are the most proud of. Well, hmm. being here about 47 years, I'm really, really proud of that. You know, and the main thing I'm proud of is that the opportunities, little things that popped up that I could have probably enter, entertained. There was one thing that really kept me from entertaining, you know, enter, entertaining it further. <clears throat> and that was mostly the kids that were here that I was working with. 
most of the kids I work with have come out of this club. And, you know, the Harrison Frazier's, uh, Colt Nose, Martin Flores, Matt Wybring, you know, Justin, uh, they came out of this club one way or another. And I think by having some of those down there, if I'd moved off, say, to Atlanta or some other place and take a job with this, this, or this, number one, I'd lose all that. I'd lose those relationships I had. And I had made a decision at that point that the, the teaching and being around the, the players and the people at the club that play golf, uh, that was a, that's pretty important. That's pr I, I did not want to change that. So there was a couple of nice opportunities that came up and I had to tell them no. And I told them the reason. He said, well, if you change your mind, would you call us? I said, thank you for your, your flattery, but uh, this has been too good to be true. So I'm, I'm very, very fortunate. Randy, we do have uh, on the call many PGA professionals, some that have been teaching for many years or certainly club professionals, some that are getting started, some that are perhaps getting started with that better player, the elite player. What, what, what's your advice along those lines? Getting started, what to pay attention to and how to develop yourself, not only as an instructor, but to some extent these days in particular uh, as a business person. Well, as a business person, if I ran my teaching as a business, they call me pro bono because half the time I forget to charge it or whatever. It's just, you know, just making filthy money off the golf course. Yes, I don't know what it is. But the one thing I would tell them is, number one, the student is very important. Okay? You're not up there to hold their hands either. So you got to have to blend being a hard ass and a love bug. And you kind of blend those together that's from the personality and part of it because you want them to like what you're doing and respect what you're doing uh very important you're not just up there going through your teaching points and this is what you need to do when they have no way shape or form they can do anything out of the book uh the one other thing i'd say is as you progress to all of a sudden you've got better players you're working toward better players make them come first what do they want? What do they dislike? How can they get happier and better? And take the feedback from the player instead of sitting there going, huh, well, I wrote a paper on this and I did this at a seminar and I read this in a book and I feel good about myself. I'm going to put that little sticker on them. You do that, you won't last very long at all. So I, I would recommend that, you know, you listen to your instruct, uh, listen to your student, especially when they get to be better players and understand what they want to do and what they want to do better. And then you go that direction because the technique will follow what you're trying to create. And Randy, this, this has probably been one of the most enjoyable half hours that we've had uh, on these, on these California chats. And we really appreciate that. And I, I've always admired you, and uh, even in this little bit of time uh, and listening to you, and uh, my admiration has grown, and I, I seriously mean that. So uh, thanks for being here today. We look forward uh, in October, uh, at least right now, you're scheduled to um, be a presenter at our California Teaching and Coaching Summit, October 17th and 18th, and we're excited about that. Uh, along with Jamie Mulligan, I think Jamie and you have made contact in that regard. And no, he he he. Jamie Mulligan, this is not going to be good for you guys to have us together. <laughs> it'll it'll this, be exciting. You better have tape delay because I love Jamie. <laughs> I love Jamie. Well, we're we're ready for you. We're ready for for Jamie. Whatever he throws out there, so. Uh, again, thanks so much and, and for taking your time. Uh, and, and we look forward to seeing you in October, if, if not before. Thanks. Well, I look forward to it. And thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Lynn, good to see you. And Tom, stay in touch, bud. Yeah, Randy, I will, for sure. Randy, thank you, particularly with the, you know, the time pressures that you have. We really appreciate you taking, you know, a half hour, a little bit more than that to be with us and educate us and be, allow us to be part of your world. Thank you. Very, very, very flattered do it. In fact, the one's up there waiting is Scotty, and you can see how much work we're doing. 
Yeah. All right, so it is not that big a deal. <laughs> Loved it. Loved that it. Is, Appreciate thanks. it. Continued success. Yeah. All right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you for being with us this Friday, June 3rd. And Tom, how about uh, time to start wrapping it up? Yeah, yeah thanks uh, again, everybody, for spending some time with us. And uh, uh, our next chat is scheduled for uh, July 15th. Uh, I know it's hard to wait that long. Uh, we've we've had withdrawals because of that. Uh, we'll have a U.S. Open presentation uh, follow up uh, for the U.S. Open. So we're excited about that as well. So thanks, everybody. Uh, again, everybody who helped. Uh, and uh, and we appreciate it very much. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. And uh, thank you, Robin, for joining us and Eric for your comments. And uh, be safe, everyone. Continue to look out for each other. Continue to play golf. Have some fun. Uh, help everybody grow, enjoy, enjoy what we have, and we'll continue to do that. And uh, enjoy the weekend. We'll start there and see you all soon. Thanks.